Cleanse my guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you When, when first came here and he, he prophesied, he really wanted some feedback, you know, from us. I didn't realize at the time that he wanted agreeable feedback, not disagreeable feedback, because he really can't take that, he can't handle it. He gets uh, very judgmental of people that didn't, wasn't really accepting his gift. He asked me several times, you know, uh, David, what do you think about my prophesying? I says, well, I says, I believe that you're prophesying in part, like the scripture says. He asked me that several times, and I told him every time that I thought you, you're prophesying in part. I think you're prophesying according to the measure of your faith. And I think he was a little disappointed at that because he really wanted people to see him as a prophet. And I told I told him about three weeks ago that I had a gift to see demons sometimes, and I told him that I saw them in him. And um, I told him that this shouldn't be a any cause for division between me and him because I've seen him and other people that needed help too. And I said, uh, I hope that one day I'll be able to help you, you know, because I can see them clearly. I know they're in there. So he came by quite often and we had quite a few talks. And, uh, recently, uh, well, Thursday when we were going out to the meeting on Gulf Breeze, I had a real long talk with him because he went with us and we had a ride out and a ride back and we talked the whole way. You know, I talked the whole way most of I guess, you know. So I could see that was totally convinced that everything that was coming through him as far as prophecy was concerned was a word from the Lord. And uh, I became concerned that maybe that the devil was using this to puff him up. And so I started sharing something with him, and I think it would be helpful for all of us to look at. I wish somebody would have shared it with him. You know, a lot of people don't realize he was only, from what he told me, only two years old in the Lord. Very young in the Lord. I told him that according to... Um, well, let me point this out to you. Now, I'm leading to somewhere, just, so just uh, be patient with me, all right? First Timothy chapter 3. I used Thursday as a, a time to try to gracefully correct his direction. I felt to be very graceful, not to be in, 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 even the slightest bit condemning, but very graceful with him and trying to show him what it was to be an elder and how to grow into the place of being an elder. Uh, I pointed out First Timothy chapter 3 that it was not possible to um, make an elder out of a novice, verse 6, uh, not a novice, lest being puffed up and fall into the condemnation of the devil. You remember the condemnation of the devil was that he was pretty proud of his beauty, you know, and he got um, puffed up and arrogant and began to take the place of God. And uh, that's exactly is what, what has been happening in his life, is taking the place of God. I noticed, I've noticed for years that people who are being moved by a, a bad spirit, that spirit is lays kind of low and it seeks to keep peace with you. But when you see it clearly and when you um, correct it, then what's hidden comes out. It pours out. I've seen this happen many times. Some of y'all that, that, that know a guy that was here in the past, it's exactly what happened there. When, when he was first time he, he was corrected, well, it just started pouring out all the air and all the foolishness started pouring out. Well, well, I know that a lot of you and I was questioning. I was asking, well, Lord, uh, what is it in? You know, what can I help him with? You know, how can I help him to grow? And uh, and is this a true gift? You know, that's in him. And uh, so I asked the Lord. You so you asked me, and <laughs> I told you the best answer I had, but. I was asking the Lord for myself. I had questions for myself, you know. So I pointed out to him, I said, two-year-olds cannot possibly be elders. I said, because we have to mature in the Lord. If you make an elder out of a novice, he's going to fall into the condemnation of the devil. The devil is going to deceive him. The devil is going to puff him up, and he's going to fall. Pride cometh before the fall. So so pointed out to me, well, what about the Apostle Paul? I mean, you know, I said, well, that wasn't an instantaneous Apostle that you had there, I mean, he went 14 years behind the Arabian Desert. Nobody knew what happened to the guy. I mean, he's out there coming to know the Lord before the Lord pushed him into his ministry. And Moses was 40 years. And, you know, I mean, even Jesus Christ was 30 years old before he began his public ministry. The Lord never gifted anybody to suddenly come into the place of having authority 
and directions of the people of God. We have to grow up into that place. The Bible says we, we have to grow up in all things into him who is the head. And uh I shared a revelation with me that I've already shared with you a long time before he ever came here. He said he said the head of the body is the is the elders, you know. I said, That's right. You know, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, they make up the head. But the Bible says we grow up in all things into him who is the head. And I pointed this out to him. I said, This is not a sudden transformation. Only the devil can deceive you into thinking it's a sudden transformation and, and getting you puffed up. Can, can cause you to think that, you know. I said, but uh, I pointed out to him that when, in the book of Acts, they be Christians. I mean, they were moments old in the Lord and were baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and prophesied several places in that. That gift does not make you suddenly grown up in the Lord. As a matter of fact, God gives you that gift when you're a baby so that you can grow up with the gift. Now, today, there's a lot of Christians that aren't entering into their gifts, and they're very old in the Lord. They're not entering into the gifts. But you know what? The Bible says to desire earnestly spiritual gifts. We should all do that. That's a command. That's not a request. That's a command. We're supposed to, we have several spiritual gifts. We ought to desire them earnestly and to seek them. Don't let the people who stumble and fall discourage you from seeking your gift, because a lot of these people didn't have instruction. And they didn't have direction. And they went to a lot of people who, who were false themselves and people who were put into the ministry who weren't elders themselves. And they didn't have direction. And, and these people were guilty. We're not giving direction to these people. The people that needed it, the young folks that needed it. He's very young in the Lord. He needs help. He's fallen into a, a, a deep ditch, strong bondage. I pointed out to him that, that the Bible says in um, 1 Corinthians 13, look at that. You know why? You know why that when you uh, you get a gift, it's, it's the gift itself is immature when you get it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, if you prophesy, you prophesy according to the measure of your faith. But he warned us there. He said, don't any of you think more highly of yourself than you are. Because gifts can have a way of doing that. They can make you think, wow, I'm somebody with God. You know? No, you're still a baby. It doesn't matter. It's a gift. You know, it's a gift. God gives us a baby gift when we're babies, and he wants us to grow up. He wants us to grow up with that gift. For instance, you know that prophecy, when, the God, when God says, prophesy according to the measure of your faith, that your, your faith is supposed to grow as you grow, because you have more to exercise faith in as you grow, because you know more of the word as you grow, you see? And the Bible says in Amos 3 and 3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? It's very necessary that we study the Word of God and come into agreement with Jesus Christ so that we can walk with Him. And we won't hear another voice, you see, because when we're immature, we hear all kinds of voices. And sometimes we think they're God. And sometimes we even hear our own mind and we think it's God. And the only way we're ever going to know better is to grow up in the Word. You know, the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 9, he says, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. You know the word perfect is also the word mature. See, when you mature, your gift matures. You can prophesy in part when you're little, but when you mature, that which is perfect is come. See, now, I'm not talking about age, <laughs> physical age. I'm talking about spiritual age, because some people do grow a lot faster than other people. And it's mainly because they devour the word and humble themselves to it faster than other people. But verse 11 says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Don't separate those verses here. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I felt as a child. I thought as a child. Now I become a man. I put away childish things. See, you prophesy in part, but when that which is mature is come, that which is in part shall be done away. See, the Lord wants us to grow up with our gifts. That's why he gives it. That's why he gave so many gifts right at the very beginning in the book of Acts. It should be that way today. That nobody should get saved and go for years without being baptized in the Holy Spirit and without manifesting the gifts. That's not God's plan. That's not biblical. You can't find that in there. That's religion short-circuiting the, the work of God there, you know, and, 
And false teaching is doing that too. So the Lord wants us to desire these gifts. They're not for us, they're for the body. It says to profit with all. They're for the body. They are our work for the body. God's work through us for the body. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 29, he gives a little direction here about when you come together, manifesting the gifts. What I'm telling you right now is, is basically what I told you on the way out Thursday morning to, to uh, go freeze. And I could see he was resisting. And I had a feeling that when I got through, he was either going to be totally against me or he was going to change his mind. Well, verse 29 says, And let the prophet speak by two or three, and let the others judge, discern. The word is discriminate. And it is also to separate. The word is to discriminate, to separate. What are you separating here? What God said, what man Exactly. Can, can it be out of the same person? Yeah, if you prophesy in part, what does it mean in part? It means part of it's God, part of it's you, and sometimes part of it's the devil. You know, you say, well, David, how can he be a prophet according to the laws of the Old Testament? I didn't say this person's a prophet. That's, there's a difference between a prophet and one who prophesies. You grow up in that gift, and you come to know the Lord through the Word so that you discern what voice is speaking to you so that you're more discriminating in what you say. And so that uh, the Lord can use your mind, he can use your spirit, and he can use your mouth, and he can prophesy according to the will of God. But until you get there, you may say some pretty foolish things and make some stumbling. And that's not for people to be critical or judge a person. A lot of people just give up because when they prophesy according to the measure of their faith, it doesn't measure up to somebody else's thinking, right? Well, there are real, true people who have a real, true gift that make mistakes and they stumble on their way to maturity in their gift. Not just prophecy, but many other gifts. It's a true gift. Many, let me say this, many false prophets didn't start out that way. They started out with true gift. And they got perverted along the way. And they started speaking for the devil along the way. They didn't start out as false prophets. That's why I pointed out to, to him that um, how is it that we have to discern a gift that's automatically perfect when it comes out of a person's mouth. We have to discern. We have to divide. We have to separate. We have to discriminate. We have to see what is according to the Word of God. See, the only sure foundation we have is the Word of God. It's not prophecy. There are some people who are really badly deceived in that area. Prophecy is not a sure foundation. In fact, let me tell you, I feel like the Lord has shown me that dreams and visions are a much surer foundation than prophecy is. Because in dreams and visions, at least your flesh is asleep. <laughs> and when you speak in tongues, your flesh doesn't have a reason to reach in there and make a change. But when you speak in English, your doctrine and your thinking can get in there. Tongues is, is given for that purpose. Like why tongues and prophecy? Well, because when you get tongues, you're going to pray to God according to his will. And there's no reason to change it because you don't know what you're saying. And there's a really good reason for that. But prophecy can be polluted. And it can be polluted in a person who has the true gift. It can be polluted. And if that person's attention isn't on the Lord, and if they don't have a real respect for the Word, they can go very far astray. They can go very far astray and lose their soul and cause other people to lose their soul too. We prophesy in part, and we prophesy according to the measure of our faith until we grow up in the knowledge, even Jesus grew in knowledge and in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. Even Jesus, the Bible says, did that. So if Jesus did it, we need to do it. There's no other way you can do it than to come into agreement with God through his word, come to realize his voice through familiarity with this word, and come to know what's not the voice of God. You know, um, well, Tom and I were talking the other night, you know, how that, some people go and study the error, and they study the error, and they study the error until, well, they know that error. But what if another error comes? They're not going to know it, right? But if you study the truth, you're going to know all error. Don't study the error, study the truth. It's like the people who, who study bogus bills. They don't study bogus bills. They study the true bill. Why do they study the true bill? Because if you know the true bill, any error that comes, and there could be a multitude of them, Anyone that comes, you're going to know it's wrong because you studied the true bill. 
you see. And I, it's that way with the scriptures. You just study the scriptures. You study the scriptures. I, I knew a guy that went to a, a cult class to find out what cults believe. And I told him before he went, I said, the Bible says, be wise unto that which is good and simple unto that which is evil. That means don't study the evil, study the good. And I, I shared this with him. He didn't listen. He went off to study in the cult class. Pretty soon I was cold. <laughs> I went to a particular church about several years ago. And when I went in there, one of the young men, I, I went to the evening service. And this young man had been slain in the spirit during the morning service. And he gave what he gave his, what the Lord had told him while he was in, un, un, slain at the evening service when I was there. And he stood up and he, and he was telling the preacher about the Lord had spoke to him and said how good the preacher was and what a marvelous job he was doing and that the church was right on the spot. And yeah. it went on and on and on. But I mean, I, in my spirit, I just, I, I just felt very uncomfortable with, with that particular situation. I thought about that since, and that was a denomination that spoke in tongues and had the, you know, the different uh, Pentecostal uh, charisma atmosphere that I was accustomed to be in. They had a wonderful praise and worship in the beginning, you know, and, but that, I remembered that, and, and I remembered a brother that I had stood next to in another church that had prophesied in tongues, and then the pastor interpreted it. And it, and it sounded, I mean, it, it it was very much in agreement with God's word. But I, I knew of a fact what kind of sins he was falling into. And I asked you at that time, why, how can somebody who's walking with the Lord and speaking in tongues and this type of thing, having been baptized in the Holy Spirit, be in that type of an immoral sin and still give a prophetic, you know, speaking of the church? Sure can't, but I, I, in fact, I, I talked to about that too, you know. I mean, I shared what I just shared with you about growing up with your gift and the need to grow up with your gift and not to think of yourself more highly. But I also got into the area of sin because it confessed some sins to me that he had gone out to minister to, for instance, a harlot and got trapped into the thing and had relations with the harlot and some other things he confessed to me. And I pointed out to him, I mean, he was really, I pointed out to him, I says, prophets don't fall into those kinds of sins. A prophet is an elder. A prophet is a, uh, it means older in the Lord. They're mature in the Lord. They don't go out to minister to people like that if they came hammer in the first place. And in the second place, they're not going to fall into those kind of sins. I says, there's no way you can be who you think you are. I poured out several of these sins that I knew about. And I said, it's not possible that God would send somebody to fall. First of all, it's not possible that God would send somebody to speak a lie. I said, I want to point out to you some, some prophecies that are not right. Well, that particular day he prophesied, this is the day of the Lord. I said, Greg, this is not the day of the Lord. Let me show you from the scriptures, it's not the day of the Lord. So anyway, I point out, I says, God prepares people to go and speak for him. He doesn't prepare people to go and stumble and fall. The reason people go and stumble and fall is they are not prepared to go. Many missionaries find that out. They go overseas and get, I know of some in particular that went overseas and got really beat up by the devil and came right back home, you know. And it was because they were ready to go and they were willing to go and they wanted to serve the Lord. They wanted to please the Lord and they were uh, interested in doing the Lord's work, but they went and weren't sent. And how many preachers fall? How many preachers fall because they went and weren't sent? Well, God's not going to send people who, who stumble around and fall into sin constantly. And I pointed this out to him. I said, it's not possible. It is not possible that you are who you think you are. I says, it is possible that God has given you a gift to prophesy, but I prophet you are not. And um, I could see that he was disagreeing with me. In fact, he, he went on to say that he, he was uh, more than a prophet. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I knew I was really in trouble. <laughs> but... Um, Anyway, what I had said to him, I had a feeling that it was going to turn him against me. Although everything I said was from the scriptures, and I was just pointing out things from the scriptures, you know. After we got back from the, the meeting, on the way back, I we carried on the same conversation you know, all the way back, and uh, he was disagreeing with me, although rather calmly, you know. However, the next morning, 
Ray had called me really early. I think it was, what, 5 o'clock or something like that. And asked me to come over and pray for him. He said he had a real bad night. He asked me to come over and pray for him. So I said I would. Well, I was in there brushing my teeth and getting ready to leave. And I just a minute or two from walking out the door. And he called. He called. And uh, said that what I said to him the, the night before, the day before, was um, had, had caused him to have ulcers. Well, I said, uh, well, I only spoke the word of God to you. I only spoke what the word is. The word gives you ulcers. And you must be on the wrong side here. Something was wrong, you know. So I said, well, well, why don't you come ride with me? You know? Well, he, you know, he wanted for me to go eat with him or go out and eat with him or something. I said, well, look, I got to go over to Ray's house. I'm going over there right now. I said, if you want, you can come ride with me. So he, he did. He came and we rode. This time it was totally contrary. I had spoken to him about some doctrinal things, you know, that, um, that he agreed with. In the past, he had agreed with me. He saw him from the scriptures and he agreed with me. One of them was that he had been going around with this prophet lady and um, and uh, an evangelist lady and, and they were ministering in different places and ministering to one another and so on and so forth and I pointed out to him from the scriptures what the Bible has to say about women as elders in the church very clearly and of course an evangelist is a, is a position of an elder and so is a prophet and uh, I pointed that out to him and I showed him that it wasn't scriptural and I told him I said well look if you can just find one verse where I'm wrong I'd be glad to listen you know of course, he couldn't come up with that. So this day, when we're going over to Ray's house, he, he said, you know, the Lord spoke to me and told me that you were wrong about that. I said, it's not possible that I'm wrong because I didn't say anything to you but quote the, the Bible. How is it possible that I'm wrong? I only quoted the Bible. He said, well, the Lord told me you're wrong. I says, well, Greg, you, you have to be careful when you say the Lord told me. And I point out to you in the scriptures that when you say the Lord told me and the Lord didn't say it, that there's a curse on that. God himself pronounced a curse on those that say the Lord saith when the Lord hasn't said. I says, you have to stick with the word. He said, forget the word. I know the Lord, and the Lord is in me, and so on and so forth. I said, Greg, I was afraid we were going to get to this. I said, I was afraid that's where we were going, is forget the word. I said, you can't forget the word. The word is Jesus. Jesus is in you. And that Jesus in you is going to agree with what this word says. He's never going to disagree with this word. This word is our rock. This word is our foundation, which means apart from this word ever. And uh, again, he just forget the word. Jesus is in me. I know Jesus, and I so on and so forth. Well, this conversation went on until I got to, I was getting to Ray's house, and I just decided at the last minute, well, I was thinking about it on the way anyway, but I said, I can't bring him in there. So I turned around when I got to house and came back home and dropped him off in the driveway. And I took off and I went back to his house again. Maybe quite late, but I, I felt like the Lord just didn't want me to bring him in there. So I decided I was going to talk to him again that evening because I, I didn't want to leave it there. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to convince him of the scriptures. I wanted to convince him that we can't depart from the scriptures and proclaim to be a prophet of the Lord. One thing a prophet's not going to do is depart from the scriptures. A real prophet. Prophet is an elder. Prophet is somebody who's mature in the Lord. And he's grown with his gift and he's grown into his gift. And when he speaks, he speaks in the name of the Lord. I mean, two years old in the Lord, I've never claimed to be an apostle. I've been in the Lord ten times that long, or more than ten times that long. But, but I've never claimed that. I've let other people decide who I am. I don't tell people who I am. I mean, that's up to you to figure out who I am. You know, the Bible talks about those who proclaim who they are, who call themselves apostles. Revelation chapter 2 and verse uh, 2. And you know the early church had trials like this. It says, I know thy works and thy toil and patience and that thou canst not bear evil men and didst try them that call themselves apostles and they are not and didst find them false. You know we have to try people. You don't want to just sit under anybody that's speaking anything. People do that because they respect man. We're not supposed to have respect for man. We ought to have respect for the Word of God. You know, the Apostle Paul warned us, that was John's, God's warning through John, but Paul warned us over in 2 Corinthians 11 about false apostles. You know, people that call themselves apostles. He says in verse uh, 13, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, fashioning themselves into apostles of Christ. Now, it wouldn't matter if you put apostles there or prophets. The same is true. 
people do fashion themselves into ministers of Satan himself fashions his ministers as ministers of righteousness, the Bible says. Yeah. So um, nobody can make themselves anybody, really, in the Lord. And the only way we've got to discern between who's right and who's wrong is who's sticking with the word. We got to stick with the word. And Amen. people that lose the respect for let me tell you something. I noticed from the very beginning, this Brownsville revival and wherever it went, is they quickly lost an interest and a respect for the word because I hear them speaking against the word of God. And it disturbed me, but I realized why they were doing it because people were trying to hold their feet to the fire about the ministry. The manifestations of the Spirit in the Word, and when their manifestations were contrary to the Word, in order to justify themselves, they departed from the Word. And they just said, well, God's doing a new thing. Tell me that. God is doing a new thing. I said, there's nothing new under the sun. The things that have been are the things that shall be. God hasn't changed a thing. He gave us this like a rock, not to depart from it. Or never to depart from it. It's a sure foundation. Sure. I mean, if, if God's going to do a new thing in that respect, then you never know what God's going to do. You never know. You never know. what You can never say anything's wrong. God's doing a new thing. But God gave us a rock to stand on. And that's this word. We're never to depart from this word. And we're to respect it so much we'll never speak against it. In the history, you know, God goes through, well, for instance, you know, in the scriptures, God's gone through cycles. Of like 490 years through scripture. Well, what's new today may be new in this 490 year cycle, but it's not new because there's nothing new under the sun, the Bible says. It's just that history keeps repeating itself in set patterns. History keeps repeating itself in set patterns. You know why? Because, because man is still human and God's still God. Whatever happens now that we think is new, we if it's of the Lord, we can find it right. somewhere. Oh, yeah. You can go back in the Bible and find it. There's nothing new. There's not even a new doctrine on this earth. These, 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 old, these doctrines that are coming out today, they've been around for years. Yeah, and, uh, can, I, can I make an observation on that? Yes. Like, uh, sometimes you run into problems with definition of terms. Some things are new that are not completely new. Mm-hmm. And, and basically, like, uh, you know, God sent Jesus to save us from our sins and, uh, and to the Jews, that was the new thing. There was a new covenant, but it wasn't new in the fact that God had already conceived it. He had already spoken it. He had already alluded to it many times in many different ways in the scriptures, and it was not a new thing that was uh, was different in character to the things he had already spoke. It fit right in with the rock of scripture that he had given them as the standard. You know, right now... Uh, you know, you can, you can make something new that no one else has ever made. But all the materials have always been here. That all the, uh, you know, the, even if that material had been changed into something new, the basic foundation building blocks were all the same. And other people have made similar things. There wasn't anything, uh, as you know what I'm saying, there's, there's some things that are completely, you know, there's nothing that's uh, completely. The manifestation of Jesus is a manifestation of what's already written in the Old Testament. All those types of shadows were talking about him. And there are some people in the Old Testament that even had that same relationship with him, you know, through the Holy Spirit. Well, the point is what, what we're talking about, a new thing, was that, um, that today is the day of the Lord. He was saying that God had perfected him that day, had finished him and perfected him. And then now he was speaking the pure word of the Lord. And I noticed several Folks had already testified to me that if you disagree with this prophecy, you're going to get very angry with him and start prophesying against you. Well, I was I was heading that way. <laughs> I was headed that way. So I decided I was going to go talk to him that evening. It was uh, Friday evening. I felt like the Lord wanted me to go on the way I prayed. Uh, when the door opened and, and was there, he was very shocked, and there was even a little bit of fear in his eyes. So I didn't think he expected to see me. And so I, I marched right in for it to close the door <laughs> because I kind of got a feeling he might do that. So I marched right in there and uh, I started talking to him and I started, you know, asking him if we could talk scriptures, you know. Well, you know, we have to be so careful. We want to justify ourselves. We'll, we'll just tweak things a little bit here and there all the way down the line. And, 
you know what happens when you get down the line, you know, a kind of a geometric progression happens and, and you're yeah. way off course down there, you know. So if you just twist and tweak things a little as you go, well, you're really going to be off course down the road. And justifying yourself is how most people fall into really deep, gross immorality, right. even as Christians. I mean, uh, he was justifying the sin even with the harlot. He was told me, you know, that he was saying that that was a spiritual thing that he had done, you know. Well, I'll tell you, that's never a spiritual thing. Any way you look at it, that is just totally twisting and perverting the word to justify yourself. But anyway, I, I, I marched in there and they started asking him, you know, can we talk scripture? Let's talk some scripture. Let's see if we'll, let's, let's make sure that we're, we're understanding one another here, you know. Well, all of a sudden he started prophesying and, and uh, speaking in tongues very loud, very loud. That's his warfare tongues. His warfare tongues. And he was looking at me and <laughs> warfare tongues, in me, I guess. <laughs> but um, I was just looking at him, and I listened for a few minutes. And I looked at a few scriptures while he was doing it. And he got louder and louder and louder. He just stayed really, really loud because he wanted to drown me out. Tony was there. I was sitting on the couch. and uh, He didn't want me to say anything that Tony could hear. I could see that. So um, he got up in my face and he spoke in tongues really loud, you know, and I said, I can speak in tongues too. I can speak in tongues too. I said, but you don't want to talk the Bible, do you? And he just, he never slowed down, just keep on. And then he started talking in English really loud, you know, singing in English really loud. Just, he never stopped. I, I thought, well, this guy's going to run out of breath sooner or later, and then I'll get to talk. He didn't run out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> so he just kept on going like that, you know, and I, and I mentioned several times, I said, Greg, what are you afraid of? You know, why are you afraid to sit down and talk scripture, talk truth here? You know, what are you afraid of? I said, you're afraid of the truth, aren't you? I just never slowed down and kept on going. So I got up and sat down next to Tony and started pointing some things out to Tony, you know, from the scriptures about elders and about prophets, it was kind of hard, because it was very loud. <laughs> and I was sitting real close to Tony, and I was just pulling some things out. This may even matter, but it, and he got louder, and he got real close to us, and he was just, you know, trying to drown us out. But it was a demon, you see. I pointed out to him this, uh, and I pointed out to him, this prophecy that he gave me. It was about me. A year ago, God gave his prophecy, and I have no doubt that it is prophecy in part, you understand? He said, um, just a week ago, he said, David, uh, God told me that Abel in this prophecy is you, that God gave you to me, and you're able to me. And well, I pointed out to him, I says, you think I'm wrong, and you think I'm in error now. I says, but this is what God, you said, God said to you about me. Now, either you were a false prophet here, or you're a false prophet now, but you're a false prophet. Because this is what the word said about me. He said, all things are good to those who are in me. I'm just picking a portion of it. It says, for I sustain you in all your ways. I give you a brother, Abel, your brother of understanding. He shall assist me in all those things that you cannot grasp. You must allow me to lead you, Abel and me, through this jungle. This jungle is overgrown with tumultuous weeds, however, you shall be overcomers through my blood. I says, you're not really obeying what God told you, or else this is a false prophecy. I said, um, you said that God told you I was able. If I'm able, then you need to let me help you to understand the things you can't grasp, and you need to help me to lead you. You need to let me to lead you like this prophecy commands you to do. I said, so either you're a false prophet then, or you're one now, or else you're going to humble yourself and sit down and listen and talk. Tony was listening to all this, and I said a few more verses, and he said, just pages in a book, that's all it is, just pages in a book. He's talking about the Bible, you know, the word, words of uh, Scripture, you know, just pages in a book. And, uh, you know, you just can't really believe that somebody that could, you know, stand among you and worship God and enjoy God and praise God and, and you think it's so holy, all of a sudden can depart so far from the Word of God, so quickly and so far. You know, it, it's delusion. You, you don't. You never know how long before the devil opens or slams up, closes the whole trap he's got on you, and, to, and you, and suddenly you are totally possessed by the devil because you departed from the Word of God. And that's exactly what was happening. He was departing from the Word of God, so he never would would quiet down. So I decided I was gonna I was gonna leave. You know, so he was prophesying at me on the way out. You know, 
even when I was going out the door, he was prophesying, you won't be back, and you won't be back. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, he's the one that's not coming back. And I didn't know what he meant, but I heard it clear. He's the one that's not coming back. So I'm going to tell you what I did. Now, you know, some of y'all, I know you don't know about this, but it's purely scriptural. From my experience in the past, it's been the one thing that will help people like this sometimes. You know, sometimes discipline in the church looks like, it looks like you're, uh, take the place of God or something, maybe. Yeah, but God wants to use people. I mean, can you imagine Ananias and Sapphira? Can you imagine Peter? The Lord spoke through Peter to Ananias and Sapphira to get this cancer out of the church. You think that was uh, Peter's anger? It was God's love. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to tell you something about this. This is God's love. You know what? You go to a business and you take you take all authority away from that boss. You go to a school and you take all authority away from that teacher. You go to anything and you take authority away from those who are in authority. And see how much discipline you got and see how unruly it gets. Because this person doesn't have any discipline. In school, what they, why are they dumping up all these kids? Because they've got no authority to exercise any discipline. You know what? In the church, there's authority to exercise discipline. God gives authority to exercise discipline. We've seen it here. Some of y'all haven't been here that long, but we've seen that authority here. And why well, I tell you, God can correct people quick. You can talk to people, and you can talk to people, and you can talk to people. And you can tell them what the Word says, and tell them what the Word says. But if they're not going to listen, then what do you do? Here's a man who was in gross error, you know, First Corinthians 5 and 5. And he had his father's wife, which is obviously his stepmother. And Paul turned him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that the Spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. So that the Spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. See, the purpose there was love. It wasn't uh, tit for tat. It wasn't anger. It wasn't personal. You know, but Paul, Paul didn't even know this man. It wasn't personal with him at all. He was there in the spirit. That's what he said. He wasn't there in the flesh. He didn't know this person. But he knew that they were putting up with this person and they shouldn't have been because he said a little leaven leavens the whole lump, don't you know? If you sit around and you listen to somebody that's in error and you keep listening to him, I tell you what, a little leaven's going to leaven the whole lump. He'll be in you. So Paul, because of love of the church body that was there and because of love of this man, see, uh, these people were putting up with this man. There was no discipline there. So so Paul turned this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Destruction of your flesh means the destruction of this old rotten entity that you're having to put up with. He's not talking about killing. He's talking about destruction of the old man. You see, he's not talking about killing you because some people worry like that. It's not talking about that. From experience, I can tell you, it ain't talking about that. Because the Lord has used me, and I never do this on my own. I can tell you, I've prayed, and I've been very careful. I, I'm afraid to do this on my own. Do you know that if you turn somebody over to Satan and it wasn't the Lord, what would happen? Nothing. <laughs> you know why? Because the curse that is caused us, a light of not. Who saith the thing and it cometh to pass except I, the Lord, have commanded it? You know, the devil don't even have that authority. Do you hear what he said? Lamentations 3 and 37. Who saith the thing and it cometh to pass except I, the Lord, have commanded it? The Lord is the only one who claims authority. You go back and look at Job. If you if you pronounce a curse out of the Bible, a biblical curse, and it comes to pass, guess what? Nothing can happen without God's permission. And if it don't come to pass, guess what? That was just hot air. It came out of you. It didn't come from God. Can't uh, Satan put curses on people? They yeah. do. Yeah, they do. But and you know what? Allow it. Well, but remember what the Scripture says: the curse that is causeless. See, Satan himself was putting a curse on this man. It didn't matter where it came from. Satan was putting a curse on this man. Why? Because of his sin. He was permitted to do it because of his sin. The Lord permitted him to do it. In fact, the Lord, in fact, the Apostle Paul reminded these people, the words that I speak unto you, they are the commandment of the Lord. See, this wasn't Paul talking here. This was the Lord. Anybody that does this, has the direction of the Lord, or nothing works. We have seen here, not that long ago, a lady that had been in this Bible study that had offended an awful lot of people, purposely trying to run people off, purposely trying to divide people. And the Lord instructed me to turn her over to the devil. And you know what? 
but that she got sick immediately. She got so deathly sick that she couldn't get out of her bed. She went to bed and she couldn't get out of that bed, and she was so sick she couldn't get out of her own excrement. This went on for several days, and finally she cried out to the Lord, and the Lord said that he was not going to release her until she went and confessed her sin to everybody, and she came and stood right over there. And she confessed what she had been doing to everybody as far as dividing and causing trouble in this little assembly here. And um, she went back home and, listen, the Lord lifted that sickness long enough for her to get over here and confess her sin and get back home. And when she got back home, it fell back on her again. And she was in the bed again. And she cried out to the Lord, Lord, what happened? I did what you said. I confessed my sin. And the Lord said to her, but you've been turned over to the devil. And she got on the phone and she called me. She said, David, I just asked the Lord why this sickness came back on me. He said, because you've been turned over to the devil. And because she didn't know it, nobody knew it. I just did what the Lord told me to do. Well, I said, yes, ma'am, that's right. You've been turned over to the devil. I said, but you've confessed your sins and I release you in the name of Jesus. And you know, she was healed. But she had a lot of respect for authority then. She had a lot of respect, because some people think God's ministers don't have any authority. God doesn't want his ministers not to have any authority, because undisciplined children will run all over them, just like what happens in the schools, you see, and what happens in the businesses. You know, when I worked at Exxon, they wouldn't fire anybody without just oodles of paperwork, because they knew this guy was going to go to the court and file suit, and if you didn't have an awful amount of proof, then he was going to come right back with pay. So you know what? They were lacking an awful lot of discipline, and people got away with things for a long time, and you had to document everything. They would say, well, if, if, if you want to fire somebody that was totally sloughing off and doing nothing and being a detriment to the whole plan, the first thing they want to find out is, no, we can't do anything to them. You don't have enough documentation. Well, what does that promote? Well, it's the same thing in a church. You know, God's, God's ministers, they're not totally helpless. You can speak like a child. You speak to a child the word. You speak to them the word. You speak to them the word. But if they're not going to, if they're not going to do anything, the parent has some authority to do something, right? That's what. And, and you hate your child if you don't discipline them. And God is not going to be that way with His children. He said, if you sin willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. So God always disciplines. Certain. Fearful expectations. He always disciplines willful disobedience. And in the church, he's given authority. We have places in here where people were struck blind, people were struck dead, people were turned over to the devil. Of uh, this man in particular, because he was polluting the church, was turned over to the devil, and because he needed the fear of God, he was turned over to the devil. You know, if you got the fear of God, you will depart from evil. The Bible says that. You know? Well. This lady got the fear of God. She talked about that several times after that. A couple of times she even felt like she wanted to get bitter about it. And I reminded her that that wasn't me, that, that was the Lord. In First Timothy, I point this out to you. This, again, this is not retaliation. This is the love of God manifested through somebody who speaks the authority of the Word of God in order to bring discipline on someone so that they will repent and also so that they will not pollute the rest of the people. First Timothy Chapter 1 and verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having thrust from them made shipwreck concerning the faith, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan that they might be taught not to blaspheme. Well, you know what blaspheme is? It's the word blasphemo. It, it means to rail against or to speak against. A person could blaspheme the Holy Spirit or a person could blaspheme you. Or uh, blaspheme just means to rail against or speak against, you understand? Obviously, these people were taught not to do this, so it wasn't necessarily blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, but it was blasphemy against Paul because Paul already talked about Alexander's blaspheming him. See? So here's, here's a man that um, obviously had hardened his conscience, justifying himself, and Paul turned him over to the devil so he would learn not to blaspheme. Well, what was happening with uh, and myself was he was blaspheming me. You know, I went in there and I asked, when he started doing that, I said, Lord, I ask you to confuse these demon spirits. To confuse them. 
I've done that before, and I saw the Lord work wonderfully. And he did confuse me. He started uh, prophesying things that he actually had to back up and say them again. You understand? That kind of lets you know, well, that didn't come from the Lord, did it? He had to go back and correct it. This happened several times. One time he started prophesying good to me. And I was looking at him, and I was smiling, and I, and I thanked him for it, you know, because he prophesied that, uh, well, First John chapter 3, he prophesied that um, I would see him even as he is. Actually, he prophesied just a little bit. He, he stopped and said, no, 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 I was talking about me. I was talking about me. <laughs> but he was pointing his finger at me, and he was addressing me, you see. And I thanked him for it. I, I said, thank you. I really believe that. I, I thank you for that. Well, the Lord was confusing him, you see. It wasn't. The Lord was confusing a demon spirit that was prophesying through I'm not saying it just started out that way. I've looked at those prophecies right there that he's given to us, and they're fairly uh, innocuous. They're fairly uh, harmless. uh, There are some good things in there. You know, they are prophesying in part. But, you know, if your spirit is contrary to somebody, you can prophesy in the flesh. You can be used by a demon spirit. You can let your anger get the best of you. You can... uh, did he start going downhill then when he got with that person that he wasn't supposed to have been with? Because I don't know. You know what? Because he could have taken on more evil spirits. I understand that since he's been saved, he's fallen into sin as a Christian several times with drugs. You don't take drugs as a Christian and not get spanking for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, many times they open you up to demon spirits. You understand? Drugs are very dangerous for Christians, just like willful disobedience is very dangerous for Christians. Most Christians who get demons get them because they willfully disobey in one form or another. If you justify it, then you're in big trouble because then you get deceiving spirits. Not just chase things on your flesh, you get deceiving spirits when you start justifying. Well, David, how did this all come about? Uh, people here saying that uh, what was being prophesied is contrary to what they doing the word. Or no, I don't think so. I mean, what opened this all up? You know, I mean, I have not been around in the few things I did hear to me sounded uh, uh, in line with God's word. Yeah. So uh, this this has kind of thrown me for a loop. Right. To, completely, truthfully. Mm-hmm. I can I can answer part of that. And, and this has been going on for a long time. And I've been praying. And I went to I've okay. talked to, uh, and I'm not trying to take credit for what God did because it wasn't me. It wasn't, but God was answering our prayers. And since I was personally involved and had already been confronting and talking to him about all this and had warned him of his warp and his uh, false prophecies. In fact, the first time he talked with y'all about it, if you, if anybody remembers, says, what do you all, I, I really want to get some feedback because others right. have told me that my prophecies were not, were, were, were off or whatever. He might not have used that. He might have said we're not from God. But I was just telling him about that he was, I felt he was warped and some of his prophecies were warped and so forth. So he got some good feedback from y'all. And next thing you know, he was back all of a sudden that, that he became much more of a monster at home, you know, and, and it was uh, ever since he was getting the positive feedback from the things y'all were saying, it, it, he became much, went back to that domineering, controlling, uh, wanting to prophesy all the time, wanting to be, you know, uh, God's man for the hour. And it, it just got, it got terrible. And, and, uh, and or to the point where I had to confront him about his lying and uh, I had to let him know that I did you know, didn't feel that God wanted me to listen to his prophecies or his teachings because they were really off the wall. And I confided to, uh, in fact, I went up to David uh, that same night and I said, I, I was, you know, one of the ones he was alluding to. I had told him that I felt like his prophecies were warped, you know, because I confessed it to him and I left it at that. But I didn't want to go into it too deep because I didn't want it to be me going and undermining him. Like I told Doug, I felt like that that David would see through it eventually and that things mm-hmm. and, and I pretty much felt like the Lord wanted me to get let him give give him enough rope to hang himself and let the best come of it. And I think in the long run the best has come of it. But go ahead, David. Well, um after I left his house, I walked over and talked to Tom for a few minutes. I kinda of told him what was going on and uh, he gave me the benefit, some of the benefit of his experience since he's known a lot longer than I have, you know. 
And um, I told Tom that I was going to turn him over to the devil because I felt that's what the Lord wanted me to do, which is what I did, you know. Well, I, I came on home and went to bed, and um, I had a dream that night. I, I can tell you, I don't even know if it was a dream because I don't know whether I was in and out of sleep, you know, but I was thinking, but I saw very plainly uh, railing in the form of prophecy, but railing at someone, didn't see who it was, but I also saw, uh, I knew that someone had called the police and he was going to jail, and it was for Tony's sake and other people's sake that he was going to jail. Because I had prayed the night before, I prayed, Lord, don't let him do this to Tony. Please separate him. I'd also prayed, Lord, don't let him come back over here with a confrontational spirit back over to our meeting here. And that night I had this, it was a dream or a vision. The only thing I knew was I woke up in the morning and it was there and I knew it. So so Tom called a little bit later and told me that's exactly what happened. That he had come over there that night and been, well, you tell Tom, I, you know. Well, actually, uh, it, just, it was that morning. It was morning about maybe 5.30, quarter to 6, somebody knocks on the door, and I said, who is it? And he said, and I thought, oh, boy. And he had uh, uh, just come over and given me a letter I showed to David that uh, was apologizing to me. He had asked me to leave. The, he had told me I had to move out of the house, and uh, I had only moved over there. I had already known that he was a you know, false prophet. I, again, I, I believe that he probably was given the original, you know, given the true gift of prophesying, but that doesn't make you a prophet, like David said. I had already, uh, so when I moved in over his house, it was with the understanding he was leaving for a month, and that uh, I was, knew that I probably would have to move out when he came back. But when he came back, we had found a, a crack pipe in his uh, room, and I asked him about it, and he first kind of seemed to lie about it and didn't. You know, but then he admitted that he had been doing it and that he had had several pipes and got rid of them and thought he had gotten rid of them all and that he wasn't sure if that was his still. He, he insisted that he wasn't sure it was his, so I said, okay. But uh, after that, he was much more humble because he had been exposed in the light. And I actually saw some fruit in his life, which for the next, I guess, period of a month, uh, of three, three, four weeks, he was actually, you know, uh, Growing in Christ, it seemed like he was uh, humble to the point where he wasn't prophesying, he wasn't trying to lead or direct, and, and we would pray together as brothers and love one another. And that was the time preceding us coming to this meeting. And, and I actually saw fruit in his life and uh, was thankful and was encouraging him in the Lord. But uh, once a week or so, he would rage against me about one thing or another, but I knew that. The motive was that he was hurt in his feelings against me because I wouldn't didn't encourage him to prophesy. I wouldn't let him just uh, teach and prophesy like he wanted to. And, and he felt like I think he was jealous over Antonio that Antonio would check with me. And he wanted Antonio to be his disciple. It's a real controlling thing, which is what I noticed the very first time I met him. And I told my friend Jeff I didn't even, I wanted to avoid him and didn't didn't agree with him about. Uh, what a great brother he was. I just said, uh, something's wrong, and I, I'd rather avoid him. But he came over that morning and, and came in, and he started, and he was just talking, and a, a demon was completely, at least one, if not more, were, uh, was talking through him, and it was like, Doubting Thomas, Doubting Thomas, receive the Holy Spirit. And he just blew on me, and from there it was just a complete rant and raving of, of a madman. He was uh, speaking, my name is Michael. Don't call me Greg. My name is Michael. I, and look at my hands. You know, I died for you, and and different things like that. And of course, all in the loud voice and the loud singing and the loud tongues. And uh, I I told him to leave as soon as he started with it, and he wouldn't. And I called 911 immediately. And uh, of course, he was hollering. Oh, you know, they couldn't hardly hear me when I called 911. And he, uh, while the cops were on the way, thank God, he. Uh, sat there and stood right in my face. I mean, he was toe-to-toe, nose-to-nose, I mean, touching me, hollering in my face in a rage, you know, just hollering. And Lord had me just stand there face-to-face uh, -face with him, as detestable as it was. Uh, bad breath and all, I had to sit there and endure it for the Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, 
then that first night he came over and prophesied, and we thought it was so great, were we deceived? Well, he was prophesying in part. So I was going to say, look how easy, if we were deceived, look how easy it is to get deceived. That's right. You know, we have to discriminate. You have to discern. Yeah, let Tom finish what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I talk today, I had, I had uh, to, uh, not to answer that question in its entirety. Dave will do that. But uh, I had, had warned a couple of my friends in here before about this, that he'll start out, that he that when he's in group, under group scrutiny, uh, he will keep it a lot more, uh, a lot more basic, a lot more safe. He'll stay on safe ground. And once he's got the accolades of the group, then he'll get in more of his crazy, wilder stuff. But again, I could sit here right now, and I could, I'm not a prophet uh, that, I, that I know of at all, and I don't, even, don't have the gift of prophesying that I know of, and I could sit here and right now give you all a prophecy that would, that would bless you, because I, I know the scriptures, I know the word of God, I could, in the flesh, I could just come out with the dust saith the Lord, and, and uh, actually probably speak a lot of God's words where it might be, you know, I don't know. But all I'm saying is, you know, I'll finish the story and make it brief. When the cops came, I, I walked out to the door finally, and he followed me. And as the cops were walking up, I said, uh, do you remember? Uh, he had told, warned me that the, he had spoken the judgment of God on me, told me that God was going to judge me. And when he was telling me I had to leave, it was because uh, I had... Uh, told him that I didn't believe in the, uh, the manifestations of the gold dust. I just said that, that, he, that he was talking to another guy about it. And I just said that I believe that God, that we're going to be ashamed one day whenever Jesus comes back and we find that we've fallen for a lot of these things, you know. And he said, so are you calling them liars that are preaching these things? And I said, well, you know, yes, the ones, you know, I meant the ones that were perpetrating it. And he said, well, are you calling me a liar? He said, the gold dust came from my hands. He said, first an oily substance exuded from my hands and then gold dust. And I said, well. Did you see it? No, of course not. And the thing is, but I do believe there was a thing. He was at a camp where they had this thing they were perpetrating, which was proof of the fraud. Right. And the thing is that the Christians today did experts say on it. They'd stay and analyze it. It turned out it wasn't even gold. And, uh, oh. But they can make the type of gold. Uh, even out of real gold, they can make gold dust. There's all kind of charlatans and things. God does all kind of real miracles. And, and, and there are, there are false miracles. And we have to be careful to, 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 they to don't, the, the the true miracles don't, are not for the glory of man. Right. They're the glory of, of God. Right. Not for making uh, a show. Exactly. Um, wasn't into making shows. It's, it, it was a common sense, the miracles that he did. They were to help people and yeah. deliver people and save and heal people, you know. This stuff is to make somebody famous. Exactly. Isn't there a scripture, David, that says that the deception is so great that if even by lack of mm-hmm. deceit, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that Long yeah. But But it also says there's going to be those who call who speak God's word. Well, we have to make sure of <laughs> well, that's what we are. Yeah. And, and I guess the point going back to that first night, what you read to me was really, it was like you said, it was uh, edifying. Yeah, it was edifying. Mm-hmm. It was very basic, yeah. but it was very truthful. It's what yeah. you would find. I didn't have a problem with that. I felt that was, see, it was appropriate. He commands us to discriminate, to discern, to judge when a prophet talks to us. He wants you to make sure that he doesn't go astray, you know. Okay. Tom, and, and so the cops came up, and uh, and I was saying to to guys, well, that's when he told me to leave. When I told him that that yes, uh, that I did believe he was a liar about that, and since he was asking, insisting that I answer him, and I I said I say that in love, and he told me, well, you have to leave here in love. This is a couple weeks before, uh, three weeks before today, and uh, so when the cops came up, I I said, well. Remember when you were pronouncing on me the judgments of God and told me that God was going to judge me, and I told you, don't be surprised if these judgments come back on you. I said, well, this is this is that that I spoke of, and the cops were walking up, and he did hear what I said. It's one of the few things he listened to while he was ranting, but he went right back into his ranting and, and started telling the cops, I'm Michael. I'm Michael. And they said, we don't care what your name is, buddy. Turn around and put your hands on me. He started you know, uh, wrestling against the cops, and of course they had the they had the uh, nightstick him in the head, and he was bleeding, and they pepper sprayed yeah. him down on the ground, and he was 
shouting all kind of things. And he looked up at me and said, Tom, you see, I, I went through the pepper spray. You, you're my witness. I went through the pepper spray. I did this for you. I, I look at my hands. You know, I died for you. He said, you see I'm the blessed blood? I, he said, this blood, I did, I'm doing it for you. I'm bleeding for you, Tom. I love you, Tom. And it's like these guys are like, shut up, you jerk. You know, and they, they uh, took him away, and he was still uh, right and raving. And, and as he left, the cops asked me, what's wrong with him? I just said, you know, it's called demonic possession. I said, I don't know if the academy taught you all about that. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that, that his pastor, uh, I didn't go and explain it. You know, I just put it simply, you know, his pastor had just told him that he had a, that he had a problem with the demon and uh, and he was arguing with the pastor and I'm gonna make so well, I had mentioned this to you just briefly, Pat, and uh, uh and he even came in there, heard me whispering to Pat and come in there and y'all most of you didn't hear it, but he come in here and said he calls me Doubting Thomas and he says uh, that I have a form of godliness but that I deny the power. And he basically right in front of Pat and I guess a couple of my other brothers here, he said God's had enough of your, uh, of, of your unbelief. God's had enough. Won't tolerate any more unbelief out of you. And I said, well, thank God. Because I hope God won't tolerate unbelief in me. I don't want to tolerate it in myself. But I just uh, kept it quiet. That's the end of my story there. They're probably going to take him to uh, lock up. Lock up. And yeah. give him some drugs. Yeah. And I don't know if that's going to affect him. It, you know, the pepper spray didn't even seem to hardly affect him. He looked up at me like they sprayed him real good, even though it was from the back. I know you get plenty of it if it gets anywhere close to your face. He looked up at me like he wasn't even phased by that pepper spray. Well, I can tell you that demon is not because no. he's still in control of that body. Right. You know? he was in she, she has gotten more and more possessed because of justifying himself exactly. in his sins. Exactly. And, uh, uh, trying to make himself somebody that he's not. Of course, I, I think people from his past are, are going to have to bear a lot of the guilt because they didn't teach him any better. I don't know who he submitted to in the past as far as uh, listening to or, or somebody said he had gold in his hand. I heard a little something about that from somewhere I don't know where about the exact thing. And I heard a little something about that from somewhere I don't know where about the exact And I'll, uh, well, that's what saying here, you know, we were all up there at uh, that night, and that's what Jerry was talking about. Yeah. Jerry says, I actually, and so did Kathleen. Just came on there. Yeah. And she says, yeah, both of them agree with that, too. Well, you know, uh, and that made me think about what this woman that had the gold teeth and all, she claimed that God had placed all them teeth in her mouth. And this was in Alabama, and she come all the way down to Christian and was given, having services down there. And this has been a few years back. And she claimed that God had placed those gold teeth, uh, every tooth in her head was gold. And come to find out that <laughs> it's something that she had placed well, in her was, mouth. There was some uh, Bible studies going on down in Fort Walton. And uh, I know that uh, Gary and Kathleen and I think and Antonio and I don't know who else had been going. I don't know whether there might have been some things that they were getting, you know, some teachings that they were getting into. Look at this verse, Deuteronomy 13 and verse 1. You know, the Lord has more to do with this than you think. If there arise in the midst of thee a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he give thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign or wonder come to pass. Now, I want to remind you of something the scripture says. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, except I, the Lord, have commanded it? Lamentations 3 and 37. So here is a, a, a prophet who has brought to pass a sign or a wonder in their midst. And the sign or wonder come to pass, where I be spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and not served. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or unto that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. See, who's the one doing the trying here? It's not the devil, it's God. And uh, the Lord is using this prophet, who is speaking something out of line, in order to try the people of God to see if they love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, and soul. 
So, you know, a, a prophet can come and say things that are correct and uh, even do signs and wonders. But when they want to draw you astray from the Jesus Christ, you know, there is a, another Jesus, which I, I, I talked to you uh, about, uh, preaching another Jesus. I said, if you say that Jesus lives in you and speaks in you, then he's going to live and speak according to this word because he is the word made flesh. And what he desires us to be, too, is the word made flesh. You know, when we submit to the word and we respect the word and we don't speak outside the word, we don't act outside the word, then that's who we are, too. Jesus is manifest in us because the word is made flesh. It's God's plan. You know? But when you got somebody bringing another Jesus and preaching another Jesus, that you submit should submit to another Jesus or respect another prophecy that doesn't quite line up with the true Jesus of the Bible, then you've got this trial right here he's talking about. Exactly. The word here for gods is Elohim. You know? Another God. Another Elohim. Elohim was one of the names for God, right? Another Elohim. Another Jesus. God's trying us, but God tries the prophets too. You know, the Bible says in Ezekiel 14 that if a prophet be deceived, the Lord has deceived that prophet. Why did he say he deceived the prophet? Look at it. Ezekiel 14 and verse 1. This is really important for us because I tell you what, there's a lot of people about to be deceived, and they've got a physical reason for believing what they want to believe. If you're believing what you want to believe, and there's any kind of physical motivation for you to believe what you want to believe, watch out. You're about to be deceived. You will be deceived. God promises it right here in Ezekiel 14. He also promises it to any prophet that does that, who believes something because they want to believe it for personal gratification, like I'm a prophet, or I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, or uh, personal gain, you know, either to be in a position of authority or to be you know, to gain something physical or gain money or gain whatever. If you believe anything because of those purposes, you are going to be deceived. He talks about that in James, I think, 4, 4 1, where he says, where does all your, your arguments and fights come from? He said, isn't it the ulterior motives that you want and you can't right. get? Yeah. So ulterior motives can, can really mislead you. It cause you to prophesy against somebody. Right. Look at this, verse 1, it says, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. You know what an idol is? An idol is a false god. An idol is something that you love more than God. An idol is something that you're putting before God. It's more important to you than God, you know? And he says, if you put this in front of your face, he goes on, should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Every man of the house of Israel that taketh his idols into his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him therein according to the multitude of his idols. You know what that means? It means God is going to deceive him. I'm going to answer him according to his idols, he says. You remember Balaam? When Balaam, Balak wanted to hire Balaam to curse the children of Israel. And uh, Balaam really wanted to go. But the Lord told him no. But anyway, Balak came back with a little more reward the next time. And so he went and asked God again. This time God said, go. While he was on his way, the angel of the Lord was there with the sword in his hand. He was going to kill him. If his mule hadn't stopped him, he would be dead. God told him to go. He told him to go because he wanted to go anyway. He answered him according to the idol of his heart. He answered him. He told him, you go. That was the idol of his heart. He told him, you go. A good prophet can go, a true prophet can go astray. The Bible talks about the error of Balaam who went astray. Why? Why did he go astray? He wanted money. Yeah, he wanted money. He went astray. Who, who sent him astray? Well, the Lord did. The Lord deceived him. The Lord deceived him. And in fact, if you don't believe that, we'll read on. You'll see very clearly. It's not just prophets. It's anybody that comes to the prophet. If you want to hear what you want to hear, you'll get to hear it. You understand what I'm talking about? If there's a reason for you to hear it other than love of God, submission to Him, and obedience to the Word, you're going to hear it. Because God is going to clean His church out. You know why the false prophets are coming in these days and the beast is coming in these days? It's because He's going to gather out of His kingdom all them that cause stumbling and do offense. 
he is going to send forth his angels and gather out of his kingdom all of them that cause stumbling and do offense. What's he talking about? He's talking about people in the kingdom now that aren't going to be left in the kingdom then because God's going to gather them out so that the so that the people of God will be spotless and blemishless. There won't be any spots or blemishes in the corporate body. See what I'm talking about? God's working on our individual body, but he's working on the corporate body. He don't want any spots and blemishes in here. See? And he'll do things to get them out. You know what? God sends prophets to weed the church, false prophets to weed the church, because the righteous won't listen, but the wicked will. They'll listen and they'll go astray. And you should never go to to someone to seek a personal prophecy, right? If you know someone who is giving prophecy, you don't go there hoping he'll call on you. No, that's an error. Oh, you yes. ask God. You go to God and you ask I've God. Done that. And that's then what, don't oh, seek a personal prophecy from a prophet. You go to God, you ask God, then God can use a prophet. And and by the way, if you're asking the prophet, if you have to ask a prophet, he ain't a prophet. If you have to ask him and you have to tell him the circumstances, he ain't a prophet. He ain't hearing from God. A prophet don't need you to tell him anything. And he don't, because you ask him, doesn't mean he's going to give you any kind of answer. A prophet is a, is a servant of the Lord. The Lord will speak to him what he wants you to hear. And he won't speak what he don't want you to hear. And a lot of people that need all this this outer knowledge and, and a request for you to prophesy, those people ain't prophets in the first place. Listen to what he's saying here. He says, I, the Lord, will answer him therein according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Return ye and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel is, that separates himself from me, and takes his idols into his heart, and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and comes to the prophet to inquire for himself of me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man, and I will make him an astonishment for a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. I'm going to make a sign out of this person who's got his idol in his heart. And I'll cut him off from the midst of my people, that you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived and speak a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. I will stretch forth my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear their iniquity. The iniquity of the prophet shall be even as the iniquity of him that seeketh after him. You know, isn't that interesting? That uh, if a person wants to do their own will, God can send him a deceiving prophet. And if a prophet wants to do his own will, God will deceive him the same way. The most dangerous thing, you see, is not a love for the truth, you see. Why are they going to all receive a lie, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and be deceived by this coming strong delusion? It's because they didn't have a love for the truth. You know, the truth is our only protection here from deception. The truth, a love for the truth, a love for the word, not depart from the word. You see, God sends false prophets to weed the church. He told me that years ago. He sends them to weed the church and take out from the church people who don't love the truth. They're there for ulterior motives that aren't good motives. And so God doesn't want them there because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. God's got a church right now that's mixed in there with the wheat as the tares. But he said he wants a spotless, blemishless bride. And you know what he's going to do? He's sending a strong delusion He's going to get the tares out of there because birds of a feather flock together. And he's going to, he said he's going to gather them into bundles to burn them so that the righteous shall shine forth in the kingdom of their father. What's he talking about? He's gotten all the spots and blemishes out. The corporate body is ready to meet the Lord. And it's not going to happen until all that happens. You see, we talk, everybody's talking about flying away. They're not going to fly away. You're talking about a spotless, blemishless, Bride, what's going to happen first is strong delusion, lying signs and wonders, he calls them. Lying signs and wonders. Lying prophets. We're going to see strong, awesome signs and wonders coming out of these people. And God's permitting it. And God said in Deuteronomy 13 and 1 that the sign of wonder will come to pass. But he says, the Lord your God trying to deceive. 
if you love the Lord, you've got with all your heart, mind, and soul. David, can I ask you a question? Several years ago, uh, you know, you, you said that we can't depart from the Word. And a lot of times, we, uh, some of the circumstances have been situations I've never seen in the church before. You know, some of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is whatever. Anyway, I just, I, I've really been struggling with whether that, you know, of the Lord or if it's like Tom was saying, a new thing that, that we're being told is going to happen. I have some loved ones who are, are caught up in some of this. And, and I, I mean, I, I, I just really, you can pray for them, Kurt, and God can show them. I, I did this, we were in a church one time where the pastor of this church was a false prophet. God told us very kindly he was. And so what we did, we started praying for the people in that church that God would start giving them dreams and visions to show them who he was. And he did it one right after another. They started getting dreams and visions and seeing this pastor in their dream and vision. And he turned out in their dream and visions as serpents, as dragons, as things. It was awesome. God opened, started opening their eyes clear. He started showing us, you know, like even with coming here, because I was caught up and I was really shocked because Jeff came into my floor today and got his hair cut. So I knew about some of the circumstances before I came tonight. In fact, I, I was asking the Lord if I should come to you. You know, I didn't want to be a, what do you call it, a ring bearer or what do you call it, a bearer. I, I didn't want to do that, but I, I didn't know what to do with all that. I was really struggling with it. Well, I can say, honestly, I was I didn't asking the Lord myself. I, I wanted to be sure. I, I don't like to make snap judgments, and I asked the Lord myself. I asked the Lord, was, I'm trying to remember if I asked the Lord, was his gift a true gift, or, was it, or, or were his prophecies a word from the Lord? But I got a negative answer. And uh, the thought came to me that we prophesy in part. You know, for you to say it's a word from the Lord can't mean it's part God's will or part God's word, right? So that's where we have to discern or discriminate or separate what is of God here and what is that person or what is maybe even the devil because the devil can get in there. If you've got false motivations, we just read it, Ezekiel 14, if you've got false motivations, the devil can get in there, you see, or your own self-will can get in there. Uh, many people have been deceived by, well, he calls it prophesying out of their own heart. Now, how do you, how do you, how does a person not prophesy out of their own heart? Look at Jeremiah 23. It's interesting that God could say these prophets were prophesying out of their own heart. They obviously thought it was the Lord, right? Right. Uh, verse 16. You know what? It's, here's Lord. an absolute proof of what I was saying a while ago. Jeremiah 23. I'm going to start in verse 21 and we'll go back to 16. It says, I sent not these prophets, yet they ran. I spake not unto them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then had they caused my people to hear my words. You see, in order to prophesy correctly, you've got to first stand in God's counsel. You've got to know the Word of God. You've got to grow up in the Word of God. Or what you speak can't possibly purely be the Word of God. Because what's coming out of you is something that's been sown in you, you see. It, it was like what God told Ezekiel. Now, you eat the roll, Ezekiel. You eat the roll of the book. And then you go speak to my people with my words. Ezekiel chapter 3. I told this to him. I said, you need to eat the roll of the book. Your doctrine is wrong. You're wrong about this and you're wrong about this. And I pointed out to you from the word that you're wrong. You see? So how could you possibly be a prophet? Your doctrine is permitting you to think things that are false. You're hearing voices that are not the voice of the Lord. And you don't know it's not the voice of the Lord. Because you haven't read the word. You see? Right here he's saying these prophets wouldn't have been false prophets if they stood in his council. Then when they spoke to the people, they would speak with his words. Go back up to 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They teach you a vanity. They speak a vision out of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. You know, have you ever noticed in the Old Testament how many false prophets there were? They always outnumbered the true prophets. They speak pleasant things. They, 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 that's why right. I like it. People like to hear people tell them what they want to hear, right? Can quench my thirsting soul.
purest water make me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus, I trust in you.